Hey everyone, Angelo here, Hollywood filmmaker, greatest screenwriter in the history of the world, recovering hobo. And it has been a year uh, since I went through six months of sexual harassment. It was a living hell. And I want to talk about how I'm making steps to recover and cope with it. I did a video recently about just what it was like to be a year out and what I'm experiencing. But I want to talk more about what I do to be well in this video. Because there's a lot I do to be well, and it helps a lot. The difficult thing is, this thing in me, this sexual harassment, this trauma I went through, like lashes through my flesh, also does a lot to me. And it's constantly almost like the light cycles in Tron. I just view these like, these, what's the word? Abstract things that are jockeying for position in me, left and right. And they're just moving by sheer force of will alone. Like nothing's propelling them. And it, it, except that I have to work to push ahead my wellness. Otherwise, this other thing will just instantly overtake me. The guy was a predator who wasn't merely a creep who felt deprived and wanted his satisfaction on me. He enjoyed torturing me. He knew I was uncomfortable. There was never any question for him of whether I did want his manipulation of me or not. He would do several things, various things, uh, tactics that... I'm sure he's developed over many years to break down my social defenses, isolate me, play things off as like a scenario where he's clearly putting in my head that he wants something sexual, but also um, putting in my head that, hey, nobody's going to believe you, Angelo. There's plenty of plausible deniability around this. Oh, you're saying I was doing it? Well, it was just something else. In fact, you're not even going to be sure. And it was like enjoying that manipulation and control of me or turning me one way and then turning me the other. And I knew what I was going through. Like, there were certain parts of me in denial. Like, I didn't want to fully acknowledge it, but I absolutely knew. I didn't want to acknowledge it out loud because it was so horrible. And the implications are things that I still live with in many ways. I can't talk about everything that I went through, except to say it was a living hell. I absolutely hated it. I don't even want to pretend like it didn't happen. Like I have to be real in that. If I pretend it's something that didn't happen, these things are going to fester in me and work their way around in me, like they're poison circulating in my blood. And I won't be able to properly do things to make myself well in response to them. So it was a living hell to go through that. I hated it. I was so angry at his manipulation and injustice and the sick way he was maneuvering me to almost like force me into acting like I was in a relationship with him. Like do things where like he made it clear he was sexually interested in me wanted to dominate me, nothing to do with consent, but also that I had no choice, that I was going to play along with it because he's just playing it off as like ordinary conversation that's, uh, that's divorced from the sexual harassment component. And that also planted a clear message or sent a clear message to me never to object to it to him because he's like, hey, I already don't care if you object. In fact, if you say you object, he's positioned himself to be able to call me crazy, to say like, what, you, you're thinking this about me? Oh, gross, Angelo, you didn't want, and that's part of the game too, the manipulation, his own self-hatred, the pain I saw in him of when he was acting out on me, like, this is normal, which if he thinks that's normal, it's because it's been made normal for him. I'm saying this in part because a lot of what I've done to recover is try and understand what happened. 
what he did, the subterfuge, the manipulation, the double life he was living and I'm sure continues to live. The clear pain I saw in him, like the hatred, the self-hatred, the acting out, the desire to inflict pain on others to make what he's feeling feel even more normal, to make it seem good, to communicate like, hey, Angelo, we have a secret agreement here in which I dominate you and you're subservient to me. And if I ever say anything to object against him, then I'm challenging his whole belief system. Then I'm the one being offensive. That's what a manipulator does. That's what a bully, a coward, an abuser does. And that's what he did. That's why I was so terrified when I called the anti-street harassment hotline while I was going through this six months and asked them what I should do. They suggested strategies like confront him with a witness. I couldn't bear to do it. Because I'm like, he's already so vicious in how he's putting up this wall to pretend like this isn't happening. And the more I've tried to study about people like him and this behavior, the more it makes sense of it to me. Again, it's never over. It's like never out of me. I'm never done dealing with it. But while I'm jockeying for position, my wellness and this sickness that he put in me, and I'm like, imagine what someone put else in him for him to act this out and risk his career and family for this. Then I have to put all this extra effort into being well, which is separate from all that garbage, its own blessing in a way. Even in a way, it's a blessing to say, I've been able to endure such horrible suffering. Like, who would want to go through this? Who could say they could stand this? And not even the sexual harassment alone. That was horrible. That was hell. What happened afterwards was a nightmare. And I can't talk about that. But it was like being in a searing inferno. I constantly have this image that I've seen in, I don't know where, like, I don't know if it was cooking shows or what. People holding those, like, sort of, it looks like a grill surface, but in their hand, on a handle, like a, not a paddle, but a handle with uh, almost like a waffle comb surface, but it's, it's like a little grill in a way, and you press down on ground beef with it. That's how I felt. I felt like I was being pressed up against a grate, and this thing was uh, crushing down on me constantly. There is no escape from what I was going through. There is no way out. There is no good choice. You're in this situation the only way out is straight through that crusher. So in a way, it's a privilege to be able to say I could suffer that much. For one thing, I'm alive. There are times when I look at myself in the mirror, I almost can't believe it. Or just believe who I am and how different I look and feel and this is a world far away from the ethical dilemmas they taught us in Catholic school as far as how do you deal with such sickness? The answer is you've already been dealt. So the things I do to be well, they're a constant struggle to keep up. But for one thing, reading, I'll just show a book now. I spilled tea all over it. That's why that brown stuff's on it. But uh, excellent book, The Honorable Boy Scout. Schoolboy. The Honorable Schoolboy, not the Boy Scout. I enjoy reading these fictional stories. It's weird. I used to not be able to stand fiction reading. I hated it. It was so dreadfully boring. Now it's all I can read. I don't even like anything real. Before I used to love reading like biographies. Um, I read Jackie Chan's first autobiography, which was written with someone else. And it, it was obvious the stories were embellished, but it was incredible. I loved it. Like Michael J. Fox's uh, other, I can't remember now, but I've read other books and um, those used to thrill me, but now I want to read fiction. 
and it's partly the influence of screenwriting on me. I'm a screenwriter, I, an unpaid screenwriter, but I'm in training. I write every day. But it, it feels to me like how in a, there's like heart surgeries where they'll put a little balloon in your artery and then blow it up to expand it in order to clear a blocked artery. That's what it feels like reading books is to me. It's like when I read afterwards, I feel like, oh, a balloon's been filled up in me and gas has been put in it, air has been put in it to open up this space in me to create a little more goodness in me, like space for just more of me. There's a little bit more. And the thing is, I have to keep going back to it and keep reading. It. Otherwise, it's like it deflates or it's like you get used to it and you you have a bigger blockage that you get to but that's a great experience even if I can only read for like 20 or 30 minutes I feel like opened up a little bit like something in me has been opened up so there's more space or there's more of me I haven't been reading poetry lately but I love doing that I, I should um I just have a book of poems and uh oh, actually somebody get, was giving away free books I got another book of poems and I would just enjoy reading them out loud and reading them slowly out loud. It's weird how the way I read them has changed over time. And so I like that. Uh, reading poems, writing. Um, I loved writing. I'm a screenwriter, screenwriter in training, but, or unpaid screenwriter, I should say. I'm taking classes for it. I love it. I've been so disciplined about, about it lately. I could always be more, but I write in the morning, like at least an hour and a half before work, and then at night, I'll just keep writing until I finish where I want to be at with my assignments. Even though I've been staying up a little late, I try not to do that. I do need to sleep. I'd love to just say, oh, I'm so tough, I can brave it out. No, if I don't sleep, I can't function. Along the lines of discipline is having strong discipline. Getting up early, 3.40 every morning, if not earlier, being quick about going to the bathroom, you know, brushing my teeth, shaving, showering, eating a breakfast where um, I used to be on a meal plan and I learned a lot about what nutrition to get, how many grams of proteins, carbs, and fats to get in a day. And now I'm not as strict, like I don't log everything like I did for six months. But now like I know like how I'm doing, I weigh myself like not every day, but almost every day. And so I just see, do I need to dial up or down? And for a while I was struggling with my discipline on that. Now I, I've been getting very disciplined about eating only what I intend to. Last night I ate more, I had a little high moment and it was a rush of like, first of all, the indigestion and all, but um, my heart was racing like, wait, I had like a, a like pasta with truffle cheese or something on it and a big cookie. And it was like, whoa, a huge hit of carbs on me and fats and uh like my stomach's pain for it somewhat but um that's another thing like having all these things not be these unknowns in my life but being strict about them my wake up time my diet exercise i'm exercising more like five six days a week something i've been slacking on that i really need to do more of is being social and um, normally I'm really good at that. Like I've been going out a lot, but with my job and writing, I've been so focused on those two things. I didn't go out for like two weeks. I'm like, oh, I feel terrible. Like my mind's been racing. I felt really low. I ended up calling a sex abuse hotline again last night to talk to someone. And I got some resources too about possibly going to other like support groups. Um, I wish I had time for, I don't know if I can get time for it because it's got to work with my schedule. But I did, decided I'm determined to go out at least once a week. And I usually I've been pretty good about that lately, or at least last two weeks I didn't, and it just messed me up so much. I feel so lonely. So I'm going to a party today. It's actually a fundraiser uh, for Streets for All, a great advocacy group in LA, great people. I've met a bunch of them and hung out with them a few times, R gone on group bike rides with them a fundraiser for them so that'll be awesome and they're like they advocate for the things i'm into like um a connected city where we can get around by any means we want yes by cars but also by driving walking or driving is cars but uh biking metro buses walking 
people should be able to get around on mobility aids, scooters. We should have more parks, affordable housing, uh, untie rent from parking costs, have a more livable city, cleaner air, all the kind of stuff. So a lot of things involved with that, but they're a great group and they've made great improvements or they pushed for great improvements in LA. And it's so great to be connected to that. To me, it's like a dream out of a movie to be connected to these people. So decided I'm going to go to that, even though I wasn't sure. I was like, eh, I should be writing. I don't know. I'm like, no, nope, I'll go. And I'm very excited for two other things this week. Very excited. And, and I'm going to keep up my discipline of writing. I don't want to miss out on that. But Thursday, I'm going to, uh, I guess it's like, what is, what is the event? It uh, Test out e-bikes and also group bike rides are going to be there. Um, it, I guess it's at an e-bike shop. I'm not sure. And then also they're going to give away free tacos. So I'm going to maybe, I don't I don't try and restrict what I'm eating at any time. But if I'm going to be riding my bike extra, like at this thing, and it's nice because it's really close to where I work, then... I could just go there after work and do this thing and with the extra bike ride, you know, work out. Do I want to just don't overindulge on the tacos. That's all. And then Friday, I'll, it'll be my first time in a movie theater in like over a year. I'm like, oh, man, I miss going to theaters. I miss being in Koreatown where I was close to all these theaters. Now I'm in West L.A. and I'm not by a metro line. So it's a little more tedious. It's like oh, I'm going to have to take two buses to get there. But at the New Beverly Theater, Quentin Tarantino's theater, I am going to see uh, from one of my favorite filmmakers of all time and performers, Harold Lloyd, The Freshman, and, uh, and that was apparently his biggest box office hit, and Girl Shy, one of my mo favorite movies of all time, my favorite movie of his. Uh, it's so touching, so beautiful, so hilarious, beautifully shot so well acted like we don't think the performances in these films because it's kind of a given like we're separated without sound i can almost picture the sound there and i don't want to like it is so beautifully done so sensitively told what a beautiful story as timeless as anything today the the other movie i can sort of compare it to is adaptation 2002 and they're both about writers harold Harold Meadows, as he's called in the movie, Harold Lloyd, plays a writer in a town of Little Bend who dreams of getting his book published on making love to women. And, of course, he's terrified of women. That's why it's called Girl Shy. But he writes a book about his love affairs, and he wants to go to the city and get his book published. And he's got this big dream, and he's in this little town he wants to get away from. I'm like, oh, who can't relate to that? And then he wants to get the girl, and uh, things get complicated from there. And it's got a 10-minute thrill sequence at the end that is just amazing. Some of the most amazing stunts. And it has such heart and emotion. And the music is amazing. Uh, at least the um, Robert Israel score. So I'm like, okay, that I 100% want to see. So Friday night, I'm going to, I'm taking two buses to the New Beverly. And I'm going to be there with my Harold Lloyd shirt on. And I'm going to be talking to people around me uh, before the movie. In between movies, is a double feature. And I'm going to be so excited. And then I'm going to be excited to take the bus home. Uh, if it's not going to take too long, I might take a scooter home. Because um, getting in a car is depressing to me. Like, it's always been depressing. I hate, I didn't know why. And it's like, oh, you're in this antisocial environment. You're in this box on wheels, this house on wheels, sealed off from everyone else. I was in a car again recently. And I was like, oh, these streets are... Yeah, they prioritize cars, and they're so lonely. I'm like, I never want this. I want to be connected to people. So I want to be on the bus after the movie. That's a place for me to feel the excitement of the film rather than be like, okay, separating from the world, getting, uh, doing this ritual where we're shutting down for the day. Always so depressing, getting in and out of cars. So I'm glad I've made those lifestyle cho choices. All those things help me with um, dealing with the uh, trauma and pain of being sexually harassed, of being abused and exploited. And I just try and be up on my discipline on other things. Even this morning, just cleaning up my apartment. My roommates, thank goodness, they're real cool. They don't make a big mess or anything. They clean up pretty well after themselves too. I'm always the cleanest person wherever I go though. So I was up at 3.40 this morning again, making my breakfast, taking a shit. 
after I had that macaroni and truffle cheese or whatever last night and uh, still feeling the indigestion from that. But um, the, the biggest thing I have to say is being active. And being active means being present. I have to do progressive muscle relaxation. So I'm showing this my fist, like clench my fist tight. I'll take a deep breath, hold my breath. I guess you don't have to hold your breath. I can't help it. If I don't do it, I don't feel like I'm doing this well. Like or clench any muscle group in your body, like your face, you like, you know, contort your face, your neck, back, chest, uh, stomach, uh, your butt, your pelvic floor muscles, those are your muscles that hold in urine thighs, all that's it, calves down to your feet. That covers pretty much everything. Arms too, did I say those? And like clench tight, so I'm clenching my fist. I count to five, and then I slowly and completely relax my muscles and exhale deeply. And what that does is make me feel more grounded in my body. You can hear me now. I'm even speaking slowly more naturally. So nothing, you know, uh, pseudoscientific about it. it. It's not any kind of club you have to pay to join. It's like, oh, here's this wellness trick. You got to pay for this thing. Read this pamphlet or something. No, no, no. It's just simple. Basically just contracting your muscles and releasing them slowly and deep breathing. And um, what that does is throughout the day, if I do, as long as I do that a little bit here and there, I've been trying to make it a practice, just do it every morning, at least. It grounds me in my body as opposed to being in my head. When I get really lonely, it's like I almost have start, I start having conversations and arguments and stuff in my head about how I wish I, like imagining scenarios in which I dealt with this uh, problem, you know, uh, like stopped the guy, insulted him, whatever, like called him out, called out the stuff that it was just a nightmare for me to deal with all this instead of all that getting back down in my body being present realizing that's going to get me nowhere I'm, my life is slipping away from me when I do that you know I'm 38 now so I've got some perspective and it just makes me realize be present and just, this is your future this is the one day that you never imagined would come because I never thought I would have a future I couldn't imagine like what life would be like at this age. Could not imagine. I had no clue what it would be like. Uh, it's not that I even couldn't imagine. I just didn't, it's, I don't know. I just didn't assume I would have a future. Didn't know what a future would mean or what it could be. And when it started happening, you know, it was, I was not prepared. It was, uh, I was lost for a long time. And it was partly, you know, big part the, depersonalization, derealization disorder I've had and the many years I spent sick with it and the events that led to me getting that disorder and not being able to process stress and just being in a fully dissociated state. I could say from pretty much all my adult life, either fully dissociated or very nearly there and always threatened with a, um, the imminent a return of this disorder which would disable me for like a year at a time and I had to learn progressive muscle relaxation as a way of dealing with it and thank goodness it helps so much and throughout the day if I really feel it feel grounded in my body I'll get goosebumps and feel just this weird release this like thing almost like poison is being coaxed out of me and it's such a pleasant sensation but I have to do this regularly and it'll just come at different parts of the day. It won't necessarily come right when I'm doing the muscle relaxation. It may come later in the day when I just remember, oh, ground myself again. Stop being in my head thinking how angry I am at all the injustice I dealt with over this. And the injustice of someone sexually harassing me, sexually abusing me, and manipulating me. And his uh, entitlement and his sense of inferiority, too, I could see in him. And his... Uh, desire to possess me and the disrespect of me and just the lie of it the lie of oh Angela you find me irresistible no I fucking do not that fucking pig I don't even like yelling about like cussing like because it's like it does really nothing for me in a way it just makes me relive anger and see I'm trying to relive it and that means getting out of my body so I got to get back in my body I'll just do a quick uh, muscle relaxation thing here. I'll, I'll like sort of scrunch my face up and do it.
So another thing I've done, rollerblading, it's a joy, particularly group rollerblading, an even greater joy. I want to get better at it. And trying to change the system. So abusers like this person, uh, one, don't exist, but two, don't get away with it. Uh, so they aren't created either, because I'm sure for most, if not all of these people, they were abused themselves and this became normal for them or abusing others became their way of trying to control the or master the trauma they went through and also just um realizing how unhappy i am with this hyper capitalist exploitative hell that we live in where i'm constantly confined to a job and i have it relatively good as far as jobs go but confined to a job, missing out on a lot of personal life, like just endeavoring like constantly at work to be able to pay for overpriced housing, which we're all, I, th I think if we just worked for like the common good, increasingly more and more as I get older, I, I'm, I'm just convinced more of like, like, I don't know, like do we need to be communists, like everyone get together for the common good build housing, have free housing, have social programs for everybody, have uh, safe neighborhoods, quality neighborhoods, get rid of all these uh, exploitative, um, hyper-capitalist chain businesses that uh, uh, don't treat their workers well and let's get like properly run shops and places where people can go and just be and not even have to spend money. And let's get better working conditions. Let's get four-day work weeks like the UAW is fighting for. Let's get labor unions. Let's get worker-owned workplaces where the profits all go to the workers. Let's get tenants unions. Let's get rent strikes. Let's get quality food. How much food do we waste? How much pollution is created from making food that poisons us? How many grocery stores are owned by like one or two companies and food is all made by like a handful of companies? And uh, how many of these companies are, whoa, uh, shook, shook the camera, are laying off workers, exploiting them, sexually abusing them, cutting them out of hours, cutting their benefits. And meanwhile, they're, they're supposed to, those bullshitters at, um, <laughs> at the car plants that are doing these interviews and saying, well, yeah, I was paid $29 million last year, but my pay was tied to performance. That's not true. Uh, because they say also like the, the workers uh, pay is tied to performance. It's like, well, there's a big difference in how they're tied to performance than yours. But also the companies do well when the workers perform well. So the workers performance makes these companies do well as far as they do well. Now that's different from how the CEOs make money, which is inflating the stock price. That's not really performance, that's bullshit. That's a bunch of parasites and leeches trying to uh, like squeeze dividends out of the workers. And you can make dividends and create the uh, higher stock prices with stock buybacks, with cutting workers' wages, cutting their hours, cutting their benefits. Uh, making cheaper cars, or, uh, over-engineering cars, overcharging for them, charging subscriptions for services on them like car manufacturers are doing now, uh, more injectable molds in them, cheaper parts, and also lobbying the government to get more uh, bailouts like or handouts like they did in 2008, and uh, car infrastructure that they do not pay for. These car manufacturers don't pay for all the roads and parking lots. Everyone else does. We just pay, we pay not only financially in paying for supposed free parking, but also we pay in the waste of infrastructure that go, that goes to all these, that spreads out our cities, that isolates us, that creates more poison in the air, that creates more traffic deaths, that instills in people this, this illusion that they're brainwashing into believing that suburban sprawl is the ideal. Let's live out in the suburbs away from the cities. And so what happens with that? More traffic, you gotta have a car to get anywhere. You look down on people who live in cities and apartments. You don't want them moving into your neighborhood. You make people poor, keep them poor. You uh, have utilities that service less and less people like gas lines, electricity, water lines, uh, trash pickup, the mail that 
have to do, I have to get so many more resources to service so many more people as opposed to uh, in the dense city centers uh, where you might have hundreds of people living in a block or a few blocks and trash pickup is uh, as a result simplified much more efficient because the uh, garbage uh, uh, pickup can happen all in one place for one building all that kind of stuff in the same similar with water build apartments require less heating and uh, cooling needs because they less heat and cold air escape so my point is i've been getting more activated about all that stuff and just aware of where i am and just having explanations for what we go through makes life more meaningful so trying to uh oppose this hyper capitalist exploitative hell we live in and create a more uh, uh, equal society, a, a just, a, a humane, a compassionate society in a world we live in, where we have time to pursue our dreams and our interests, and be with our families and be with friends and make friends and all that. How many people are lonely today? How many people uh, haven't uh, hugged someone in a while? How many people work crappy dead-end jobs that are meaningless to them how many people have not had any kind of like you know uh, romantic inter interaction in years how many people give up on their life and take their own life how much of that could be abated by having a more decent humane people friendly world we could do it like they say poverty is not a choice it's a policy it's not a failing it is a policy. As it is, capitalists need people to be poor. They need them to stay poor. They need to cut social services so that they always have this cudgel forcing them into exploitative jobs where the employers don't have to pay much, don't have to treat them very well, because uh, people know the alternative is uh, absolute misery, poverty, homelessness, death, as opposed to uh, some homelessness for a lot of working people. I went through that. Uh, some poverty, a lot of poverty in many cases, but um, uh, some death, some sickness, well, a lot of all those things. But it's just you're going to be at least able to barely get by while the GM and Stellantis and all these garbage boneheads, like these are just dumb people, how they don't realize how ignorant they are when they talk about how well i made 29 million dollars last year because uh, our company's performance was good it's like really get into that open the books see what performance means to those people and we have an environment where within this hyper capitalist exploitative hell sexual abusers can get away with what they do and so it's the whole system that needs changing so I don't want to be too angry right now. I want to be well. I'm actually going to uh, get to some other stuff shortly. Uh, I forgot a few groceries last night. I mean, I, damn it, I forgot. So I'm going to ride my bike to the grocery store. I'm not going to walk to the fucking chain. Well, wait a minute. I am going to bike to a chain place. I'm going to bike to Trader Joe's. And Trader Joe's, they've had problems too with like employees trying to unionize. And they fire the employees, retaliate, and don't treat them well. Like Trader Joe's has gone downhill as far as that goes probably better than a lot of other stores. So I'm not going to go to the other place nearby, uh, an even bigger chain place or, or more homogenized chain place. I'm going to ride my bike, get some exercise. And, you know, what can we do? We all are stuck in this system. Like you can't outwit it. You can't escape it unless you're just like living off the grid and building everything yourself. Like, so what can we do? We can try and change it while we live in it. I'm going to do one last bit of muscle relaxation this time. I will squeeze or contract my, uh, my butt. And the last thing I do, of course, is make videos as well. 
Uh, it helps to have this connection out there to reflect on what I'm doing. I journal as well, I should say that, not as often as I'd like. I used to a lot more. And having this YouTube channel for 14 years now, it's actually, I think about, just about to be 15 years. It's amazing, it's incredible. The YouTube capitalist exploiter as well. But uh, enough about the complaints. I wanna show a way for it, a show a way to aspire, like a, a way that people can actually want to live as opposed to just saying all the stuff that isn't working. And by showing how, like, the example I want to be to myself, I hope that it puts in sharp relief the problems of the world with all these other things we, I talked about that almost don't even need mentioning. And to me, that makes uh, it, being well that much more powerful and trying to have my own integrity and knowing I've suffered and, you know, gone through this with the most integrity I could. And that, in that way, it was a privilege. Not going through what I did. I would have liked if I never experienced this, if I didn't know what this existence was like. My last year and a half of my life has been knowing this thing. I'm like, man, like, is, is my whole, the rest of my life going to be darkened by this thing? Like, this shadow's going to be over everything? Can I ever really be myself with this thing in me, this a trauma from sexual harassment. And I don't want to talk about it like that. I want to do the things that feel well, like that being the answer, like dilating, like I said, like a, a balloon in an artery, dilating that wellness, that good space in me and creating more room for goodness in my life. So that's what I got to do. So anyways, and get on my bike, do my thing, do some writing this morning. Can't wait to finish this book. This is pretty exciting. If you uh, are a fan of spy novels like I am, and this is John Le Carre, um, The Honorable Schoolboy. It's the sequel to Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, which I also read and loved, even though I didn't understand a lot of it. I still love it. was like, wow, it made a strong impression on me. I loved it. I have no idea how they caught Bill Hayden in the end. Oh, yeah. Oops. Uh, spoiler. <laughs> but uh, if you know good spy novels or... Yeah, I'd say spy novels, mysteries, detective stories. I'm into that right now. Or comic books as well. Let me know. I read Torso, the comic. That was good. I read it online. The website sucked. Ugh, just a pain in the ass to re resize everything so you could read it. But uh, let me know any uh, book recommendations because those help me. Uh, and I have plenty of books I want to read through now. But I uh, want to make time for more. And that's why I want to stop this capitalist exploitation we live in and create you know a community like have us in communion with each other it doesn't mean getting along all the time it doesn't mean our problems will be stopped but it means being intentional and deliberate about how we live as opposed to being ground up and ground down with how we live so let's start right here let's build our own community across youtube or across the internet i'm off social media for the most part can't stand it, but YouTube I'm still on. So just across YouTube, let's let each other know what uh, some good book recommendations are. And also I think of uh, Viktor Frankl saying, um, you know, instead of wondering what can you expect from life, ask what does life expect from you? Because when I ask that of myself, when I'm flipping out, like going manic with like, here's what I wish I you know, would have done uh, it, it while well, you know to stop what was happening to me, thinking, okay, what could anyone do right now? Well, the answer is nobody could stop all this. Nobody could just resolve all this pain all at once. Nobody could j address all their life's problems at once because I've had other crises to deal with too. And what could anyone do in this situation? Well, all they could do is exactly what I'm doing being well, choosing wellness, being intentional about wellness, not falling for this, uh, you know, claptrap and brainwashed garbage of, uh, you know, bootlicking for our capitalist oppressors and uh, choosing to exploit others and embrace bigotry and conspiracy theories and stupid superstitions and harboring ugly um, 
bigoted views about others. I mentioned bigotry, but there's so much of that I see, like, about basically everyone except uh, for a select group of straight white men. Uh, there's people expounding bigotry towards them and uplifting people and choosing communities, choosing wellness, choosing to be connected to people. On my block, it's so antisocial in a way. We have all these apartments here, nice yards and everything, and then you just see these big steel boxes on wheels lining the street so you can't even step onto the sidewalk for most of it. I'm like, I know there's got to be some people here who could opt for using a bike and don't or haven't thought of it as a viable means of transportation. And there's people here who uh, maybe can't because they need a car to get around and, and for work. And maybe there's people who could be convinced and who should be convinced. And it's like, let's not wait for other people to do that. I'll do it. Let me do it myself. I want to set up a block party on my block so we can see what it's like to not have cars on the street. So people can experience it rather than just telling them about the benefits of it. So let's see. I've been going for 40 minutes now. That's long enough. I'm going to try and be well. i got to eat and ride my bike. I love riding my bike. <laughs> yeah, it sounds funny. Clip that. Somebody just put it, post it out of context. And also rollerblading. Uh, I've only done about 20 hours of it. Still got to get better. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. Let's uh, tear down this capitalist, capitalist uh, patriarchal system we're in. Let's have people power. Let's have solidarity. And uh, let's have uh, kindness, decency, civility, support, health. And I got to keep writing. So I'm going to write. All right, bye.